That's a mouthful. So if you're not here for that, stay here anyway, because I think it'll be interesting. Um, I've been asked to tell everyone to turn off their phones, but I don't think anyone will do that. So if you could just put it in silent or do not disturb mode, I would appreciate that greatly. Um, we have a great panel here today. Uh, first up, we have Kurt Seedlitz, who's the founder of Focused Advocacy here in Austin. Uh, he's a bit of a local expert. He spent 10 years in the Texas legislature and uh, sponsored the legislation that rewrote the Texas electric and telecom regulations. So he'll be able to give us a little bit of background on that. Next up will be myself and Jerry Letterer. I'm Angelina Panateri. I'm the Principal Associate for Information Technology and Communications at the National League of Cities. And Jerry is a partner at Best Best and Krieger's Municipal Law Group. And I think a lot of you already know him very well. He's been a long time. I'll let you decide. He's been a longtime advocate for local rights and authority in federal activity on telecommunications issues. And in 2011, he was named the NATOA Member of the Year. So with that, I'll let Kurt get started. Is he, we need the other slide. Let's see if we're... Zeke, is it up? There we go. There we go. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I know how difficult it is to sit out there and, and listen to something to try to get some CLE, and hopefully we'll give you some information out of this. Uh, my name is Kurt Seidlitz. Uh, I live here in Austin. been here about 20 years, so I would be remiss if I didn't welcome those outside of Austin or Texas. How many folks are from outside of Texas? Jeez, a lot. <laughs> Georgia and I are the only ones here from Austin. No, there's a couple others, but uh, well, welcome to Austin. I'm glad you're enjoying our fall weather. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a balmy 94 out there this afternoon with about 60 degree humidity. So uh, you could be in Houston though. At least there's something to do here nice. So we, we welcome you here. Uh, I'm actually pinch hitting for my uh, law partner, Snapper Carr, he of the catchy name, Snapper. Uh, I started to go by Skipper today, but Christina Caney, my colleague out there, wouldn't let me. Uh, Snapper is on vacation. He gives you his best uh, tongue-in-cheek there. Uh, I'll also start off by saying uh, Angelina said I was a legislator, so that gives me a lot of great license with facts. Uh, <laughs> even though that was many years ago. And uh, in the spirit of the political season, for those of you who are older um, than me, or as old as me, remember Joe Biden, I will plagiarize heavily today. And um, I will try to attribute to folks uh, such as Clarence West, Snapper, uh, Don Knight, uh, Jay Dogie and others, Jeffrey Gay, that have worked in this arena. So even though I'm a lawyer, I don't really practice law. So give me that advantage for a minute. But when we were setting up the program, they thought it might be interesting, since y'all are from out of state, is how things actually work a little bit here in the process in Texas. And I'm going to use a little case study to go through and show you today. And if you have any questions, I will dance. I don't know if I'll dance better than Rick Perry, but I'll certainly give it, give it, give it the shot. So, all right, next up. So today we're going to talk just about a little bit about a little history here in Texas uh, from a Texas perspective, uh, the issues, the forums, and the stakeholders that we deal with down here, the illustrative case study, which will be the Crown Castle issue on uh, small cell nodes that we've talked about, uh, the game, by that I'm talking about how we play the game around here and a little bit of the process, and then the uh, survival and winning. Um, states do matter. Uh, even though we have a lot of federal legislation. Um, this is just a little blank history about uh, <laughs> telecom Texas style, a historical perspective. Zeke, I'm supposed to say your name. Is there anything up there? There it is. Mm. All right. HB 2128. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because in my, my viewpoint, in 1995, the legislature, and in previous years, had actually started addressing 
telecom, telecom laws here in Texas as well as uh, electric utility, as Angelina said. So I had the good fortune to be in the legislature at that time. Uh, it actually provided me a job later in life. So, uh, but HB 2128 was a big, big fight, and it's the one that actually set up the deregulation of the telecom markets here in Texas. Uh, the point that I was saying was interesting is, here it's come of age at age 21, and even though we had a 1996 Federal Telecom Act, and we've had subsequent uh, revisions to the act, it's pretty much stayed the same. And I have to say it's uh, been very, very, um, I think, uh, productive for consumers here in Texas. The uh, other one I want to talk about was in 2005, 10 years later, was kind of an, an ultimate fight it called Senate Bill 5. And that was between all the cable companies and the cities over franchise fees. Basically set the stage for statewide franchise fees. The cable guys uh, basically uh, came up with the idea that they didn't want to go city to city normally. And so they wanted to do something on a statewide basis. It also touched on power line systems and broadband uh, reduce some more regulations, but the main thing and the main battle was the established state issued franchise uh, to provide cable services. Um, that Kurt, also Kurt, took Kurt, two legislative you, sessions hey, Kurt, to get that done. But before you give a couple of the cable guys in the audience a heart attack, it, it was the telephone company guys that were seeking the statewide. The franchise, <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, Snapper was very involved in yes, that case, and it went two, uh, two special sessions beyond the regular session to get it. Uh, I'll give you a little anecdote about that uh, in a little while on how to influence legislators as we go forward. Um, the next one, we don't know what the House bill or the Senate bill is going to be this session, but I anticipate there will be uh, legislation uh, coming out of the uh, case that I mentioned earlier, the Crown Castle case. So um, I don't know what it's going to be yet, but we will we'll find out as we go. I would mention for the upcoming legislative session here in Texas, I don't know how it is in other states. I, I would invite comments on this. But there's a kind of a war between the state level and the city level here in Texas. Um, remember, used to everybody blamed D.C. for everything. Well, now it's more in vogue for the state to kind of do this. Don't look at me over here, but look at the locals and the cities aren't doing their job or their, if you tried to get from the airport and you used your Uber app, you didn't get here. Uh, <laughs> because Uber was kind of voted out earlier this year, although we have some ride sharing. You put that together with plastic bag bans and other issues that the state thinks they know better about than cities on a local basis. And that's kind of the atmosphere we're working under here in Texas. Um, just a few little regulatory and legislative issues, and I've just put, highlighted the two that I think you may be interested in, franchise and right-of-way and poll attachments. There are a lot of issues every time with cities, mainly from a municipal utility uh, perspective uh, that, that come about during the this session. One I might just mention on the electric side, which I, MOU deregulation is always around, and governance, general fund transfer. And then we have a lot of issues on uh, siting, not only transmission, but also uh, lines for uh, phone service, et cetera. And eminent domain issues are always around. Uh, the policy forms we work in, of course, it starts with the municipal regulators. Uh, at the city level, which a lot of times in various issues, especially on the electric side, you can bypass. Uh, we have state regulators, Public Utility Commission of Texas, three appointed commissioners by the governor. They serve, uh, I think, six-year terms, some too long. Uh, that was established in 1975. Our legislature meets every other year, 150 reps and 31 senators. Of course, you have the lieutenant governor and the governor and then, of course, the court system. Uh, I just threw a couple of stakeholders that always come up in these issues that we're talking about here today, cities, utility providers, and consumers. So here, the case in point that we're going to focus on is uh, 
you all heard of the Crown Castle case, I hope. Crown Castle is a provider out of Houston, wireless provider, and they have uh, discovered the, the small cell nodes uh, with smaller towers and to avoid antenna towers. So they're saying we can operate in the right of way without city consent. And they cite, uh, I think it's uh, section 283 of the local government code as a basis for their uh, belief that they can do that without uh, paying fees. Well, the city of Dallas thinks differently and they imposed uh, some fees on Crown Castle and Crown Castle filed a complaint with the Public Utility Commission and that's the docket uh, right there. And it cites 283 and also the PUC substantive rules, which are basically an interpretation of, of 283 as rulemakings go. Uh, the, th the third forum that I think it's gonna be debated in is gonna be the Texas legislature coming up. And we have two substantive committees, the Senate uh, Business and Commerce in the House Committee on State Affairs. It's, uh, so let's, let's play it out here. Uh, in Texas, the law, we're gonna look at the laws here. Of course, the city of Dallas imposed, I mentioned chapter 283, the PUC substantive rules, and also the Texas Constitution, which uh, if you go way back in history, have always allowed the cities to regulate their right of ways and to receive some kind of compensation for it. We think after the litigation, and uh, Clarence West, I don't know if y'all know Clarence, longtime lawyer here in Texas, does great work for Texas Municipal League and others, uh, has just written some great, great information on this and thoroughly analyzed every statute from every, every angle. Uh, he actually sent a letter, I think, to the providers in Crown Castle and basically said, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong and here's why, and he accomplished it in three paragraphs. So I thought that was pretty darn good. So I feel fairly comfortable after the litigation, we're right on that issue. We win. The problem is not so fast because historically around here, if you lose in the courts or if you lose at the PUC, you still have the legislature as the backup. And that's what folks uh, tend to do and a lot of the, the city regulations that folks don't like, like developers, et cetera, they'll just come to Austin and pass a law that you know, pretty much does some preemption on them. Uh, as I mentioned, when the legislature's in town, it does bring a new meaning to the de novo. Uh, it also reminds me of the old saying, uh, I actually went back and researched it to make sure I was right, but uh, Mark Twain's old, no man's life, liberty of property, are safe while the legislature is in session. Y'all have heard that one. There is uh, an amendment to that in Texas and they add no man's wife. Uh, so, uh, there's a little insight. Um, but legislative truisms, as I mentioned, we have a real short uh, session for legislative legislators for, I just saw the other day, Texas is the ninth largest economy in the world. Ninth largest economy in the world, bigger than Russia. I don't know if that says that much for us or says too little about Russia, but uh, we're, we're, certainly, we're certainly big and big in the uh, economy. Uh, they can also have special sessions. I mentioned when they did uh, Senate Bill 5 in 2005, it took two special sessions to get that bill done. And it was mainly just uh, prodding by the big guys to ask the governor to continue to, to make, uh, make the legislature work on that issue. They always have interim committees, and that's really where a lot of, most of the work, just from personal experience, back in, uh, two or when was that, 1994, 19, most of the year of 1994, we had probably every other week meetings with stakeholders of about 25 people. And when you get lawyers, we're all, we all love lawyers because we can all bill, but, uh, there's probably 25 folks in the room at every one of those meetings. And we, we kind of came to a consensus, not all consensus, but it worked real well. That's usually the way the legislature works around here. They don't really like conflict because they've got friends on both sides, i.e. both sides give them money uh, and help in their campaigns. 
But these lobby battles are usually driven by two sources, used to a lot by the first one. And that was uh, customers and constituent outcries, you know, price, service, uh, land issues. I mentioned the eminent domain, are they taking my land for something along the way? Uh, a lot of it lately is the provider's attempt to diminish the regulatory oversight or to gain a competitive edge over their competitors. And uh, that seems to be a lot of them. The matchups, um, always fond of saying cities are always involved. If you look at the legislature and how many bills are filed, they affect cities more than anybody else. I mean, they're, we're in every issue that comes along. Our firm, we represent cities from West Texas to East Texas to South Texas to North Texas, but we can always find an alignment between the, uh, the city's interest uh, and provide a united front. Uh, providers versus consumer groups, providers versus providers, and um, I, I call the 2005 deal kind of a death match uh, in a post-1995 deal. So how can cities still play and survive the legislative game? This is one that Tim and Angelina and Jerry thought might be of interest to y'all because I don't know what it is. I, when I ran for office, I thought, gee, I mean, hey, those people, you know, they're gonna be smart when I get down there. This isn't being recorded, right? <laughs> they're gonna be real smart. They know everything and dadgummit, there's a governor and there's a lieutenant governor and there's all these big senators. Uh, it didn't take me long to figure they're just like me and you. In fact, y'all are much smarter. Uh, so there shouldn't be any kind of, you can't talk to these people because you really can talk to them. The problem is, and I'll, I'll use a little analogy here, cities are kind of akin to small major league baseball markets, you know, Milwaukee, Kansas City, although Kansas City's had success. The Yankees and Dodgers are the phones and cables. I mean, they spend way beyond their spending cap, uh, and they take it real serious. It's like that PGA commercial, y'all ever see it? They show golfers hitting these great shots, and then they go, those guys are good. Those guys are good. They know where to play, they know how to play, and they know exactly the sequence they need to play in. Uh, Christina and I, we're, we're gonna put an asterisk by this one, because we, we found in 2005, AT&T had 101 registered lobbyists. There's 181 members of the legislature. When you throw in the cable guys, we think there was 187, 187. So that's more than one Jerry to one in 2005. Uh, the 15 million, I think that's light of what they spent, but that's what was reported. We do have ethics commissions here and George, I used Jeffrey's quote here was, uh, there was more money flowing than I could have fathomed to make sure they got a warm reception in Texas. Uh, fact of the matter is, those guys, AT&T, Time Warner back then, uh, Charter, Crown Castle, they've been working members for year, years. Uh, just as a, a, an anecdote, uh, I remember when I first came to the legislature, you were a phone guy or you were a cable guy. You weren't a local phone guy or a long distance or back then actually pay phone guys. You just were a phone guy. And it took all the members about two sessions just to figure out what camp they were from because there were so many of them. We started to put, institute a rule. You had to wear a gimme cap when you went to the, uh, went, went to the hearings. And TML, Tech Fui, Texas Coalition for Cities for Utility Issues, uh, and the cities always uh, we team up and sometimes with the consumer groups because we're usually on the side of, side of right. Um, this is what you want to avoid. I don't know if y'all can see that that well, but uh, it's uh, Custer coming back over and they're saying, now stay calm, let's hear what they said to Bill. <laughs> and uh, that's very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> but you want to avoid those errors, so how can, uh, how can we win in this deal? Uh, since y'all are in Texas, you gotta play poker and you gotta play hold'em poker. And uh, these are just some outlines of what, what you do. When you talk to anybody, I don't care if it's Congress, if it's whichever state, Massachusetts, we used to have to work Massachusetts and others. 
but just understand and message your end goal when you're talking to these folks. You got to get to know and cultivate the legislative member. Uh, and when you're talking to your clients, I would tell them, look, two things. One, use all your cards. Whatever relationships at the city level and at the business level, you play them, you use them. Uh, in the Texas legislature, there's about 6,000 bills filed. One would think that members know something about a little bit of everything. They really don't. There's just no way. There is absolutely no way. So if you can gain their confidence and become, uh, become part of their inner circle and use the folks back home, you'll do real well. And the main thing is, is always play them straight or they won't listen to you ever again. So states do matter as we go forward. Uh, I know a lot of focus is on the federal and Jerry's gonna talk uh, exhaustively about that and on a deeper legal level than I've talked to you about. But the stakes are high, but don't give up on the, on the states. Uh, you got to ante up, you got to play the game, and every seat at the table matters, and we always try to play to win. And uh, Christina found us a winning hand over here, and if you ever get that, you won't have to come back to a conference like this, that's for sure. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, I guess we're, we're going to hold questions till the end. Is that yeah. fair? Yep. Okay. Thank you all very much. Oh, it is on, that's good. Um, so Jerry and I are gonna cover what's going on at the federal level. Um, we thought we would divide it up a little bit so you wouldn't have to listen to either of us talk for the whole time. Um, so I'll kick things off with a little bit about what's happening in, thank you, in Congress so far. So it's sort of a mixed bag and I'm really glad that Kurt um, gave you some pointers because I think what applies at the state level really applies at the federal level. And something that I keep hearing, I've heard it at this con conference, I've heard it at other ones, is people from DC come down and talk about how local is where everything's happening. Um, and they talk about what great work that cities are doing and then they turn around and say, but cities are obstructionist and so we need to stop them from doing anything. <laughs> so that's sort of been the overwhelming theme and I think it's something that we need to keep guarding against. Um, Congress hasn't been doing a whole lot, but when they do get down to work, they cause a lot of trouble. Um, I think the best example of that is one of the bills that they actually managed to pass this year, the Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act. Um, that was not a good one. And I think even though there wasn't a ton of energy that I saw at the local level around this, it really was a loss for uh, local governments. What this does, it was passed as part of a trade bill it permanently prohibits local governments from collecting taxes on internet access services. There weren't a lot of local governments that were doing it because there had been such a long moratorium that had been perennially, perennially renewed. Not very many places were grandfathered in. Lots of places weren't choosing to do it. But it's been taken off the table as an option. And as more communication services are switching from traditional phone and cable services to internet, I think that's really gonna hurt us in the longer term. Um, but that is something that they managed to get done, lucky us. Uh, the other couple of things related to... Could we, yeah. could we just add, uh, just because Kurt explained to you chapter 283, is the code here that oversees rights of way and compensation for local governments. There is a footnote to the Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act uh, that actually deals with Chapter 283. It was a exemption that was written in by Senator K. Bailey Hutchison, and that does not appear to have been impacted, and at least that's gonna be our position in five years when the rest of the other uh, uh, grandfathers uh, uh, expire. Um, other tax issues that have come up this year um, include the Wireless Tax Fairness Act. That's another moratorium. That would be on wireless taxes specifically. Um, pretty much everything else that I'm discuss discussing has not passed. And we have very little of this current legislative session left to us. So fingers crossed that it won't. Um, but as we've seen, anything can happen with the budget and continuing resolution process, so that's why we're spending a lot of time keeping a close eye on what does move. 
Um, the other really interesting issue that I think merits more discussion is the issue of online sales tax. This is something that we've been fighting forever. Um, last year, we thought we were seeing some progress. Uh, this year, there's a handful of bills being discussed. We have the Remote Transactions Parity Act in the House, as well as the Marketplace Fairness Act in the Senate. Both of those are what's called um, destination-based. So basically, that means if somebody is buying something online, the way that it would be taxed is based on where it's going, not where it's being sold from. Um, that's something that we've been very supportive of. In the Senate, at least, it's had bipartisan support. In the House, it's a different issue, and it's complicated not just for partisan reasons, but for procedural ones. Um, in the House, the jurisdiction for this falls under the House Judiciary Committee, and the chairman of that committee has a very different idea about how this issue should be handled. He's um, been circulating a draft of something called the Online Sales Tax Simplification Act, which does the exact opposite of what its title would indicate. Um, it's a pretty complicated bill that does sort of what I've heard referred to as a hybrid origin sourcing. And let me check my notes because I'm not a tax person and I want to get it right. Um, but basically, it would tax it based on the here we go. It would tax it based on what is taxed in the destination, um, sorry, on the origin, and then the rate of the destination. So it's a combination of multiple jurisdictions tax laws that is somehow supposed to simplify the problem of collecting taxes on online purchases. My personal theory is that it's a poison pill and it's not actually a serious contribution to the discussion. Um, <laughs> I don't know if well, Jerry has an opinion no, on I, that. No, I, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. And this is where we're at a huge loss because our colleague Tim Lay can't be with us and we're all sort of, we're, we're inefficient substitutes for Tim. Tim's the real expert in the tax world. But, but I, I think an example here would work. So, suppose you're buying something in New Jersey, right? And that's where it's being sold from. And in New Jersey, for instance, perhaps they don't tax food, right? Food is exempt from sales tax. And I'm buying it from, the, uh, from M Montgomery County, Maryland, where I've got a 10% sales tax. And in fact, they do tax food in Montgomery County. Again, I don't know that for a fact, just go, go with me, right? The first thing you would look to see is whether or not food is taxed in the state of the seller. And if it's not, then there's no tax. If it were taxed in the state of the seller, then the rate would be established by the state of the buyer. And so it really is very complex. I think if, if, if Chairman Goodlatte was here or his staff was here, I think that what they would say or their justification would be that they're trying to respect the local decision-making process or the state decision-making process to the greatest extent possible. I'm not saying I agree with it. I think that that's their, their defense would be. Could I just make one more point again? Tim would make it if, if you were here. And Adam, you scared the but Jesus out of me sitting there because I want to make sure that it doesn't get reported wrong. Local government never opposed making permanent the Internet Tax Freedom Act. What we opposed was that becoming permanent without addressing the online transaction taxes. Right? And the whole idea being that it's not fair when an awful lot of the local economy, and the National League of Cities has got great studies on this, when the local economy many times is based upon sales taxes, and there's this gaping you know, escape hatch uh, for folks to be able to just, you know, even businesses to do these things online, and it's just a, it's an equity thing. So again, we didn't have a problem with the the Internet Tax Freedom Act being extended on a temporary basis until there was a resolution to the transactional side, and I just want to make that clear because I mean, folks in Washington would like to accuse us of trying to tax everything. So. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's definitely the perception, and I, I, I think um, this is getting really inside the beltway, inside baseball. Um, but for a long time, the discussion had been pairing those two concepts. So we wouldn't necessarily win everything, but the idea that maybe if we extended or made permanent the internet tax issue, then we would get the sales tax. Um, and in losing that half of it, we lost a bargaining chip. And so exactly. that's, a, that's a problem for us going forward, and it's something that we really need to push on. Um, so like I said, 
the Online Sales Tax Simplification Act does none of that. Um, but it is the one option that the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee supports. And the reason that this is important is because Speaker Ryan has expressed repeatedly his commitment to what they're calling normal order. And what that means to him personally is letting things proceed through their committees of jurisdiction and not overruling the committee chairs. Um, because that is important to him, what he thinks about this issue and what he may have said to us in private is not really that important right now because he's not going to overrule the chairman and so what the chairman wants to do in his committee is what's going to happen. Um, that means bad news for us in this Congress. It could mean something different if things change. Um, but I don't really expect any of these sales tax bills to move or make real progress this year. There's just too much disagreement and very few people actually agree with the chairman on his bill. Um, it's still a draft that's circulating, so, and he has been talking about it for the better part of the year. So we'll see what happens on this one. Um, there are lots of other things that have been making some progress. Uh, we're not really sure, well, okay. We're not really thinking that any of them are going to move very far this year, but a lot of them have been furthering the conversation. Um, the one that's made the most progress and had the most bipartisan support is the Mobile Now Act in the Senate. And this is actually a good victory for us. A lot of times in advocacy, a victory is stopping something from happening, which is maybe a little less satisfying, but has the same end result for you. Um, so in the case of the Mobile Now Act, the overall purpose of the bill is to free up spectrum. Um, but there was originally a provision in the language that really would have limited local zoning authority. Um, and through a lot of local advocacy, it was taken out. And I don't know if you want to add anything about that. I, I think one of the things that, that folks in D.C. are guilty of is sometimes taking credit for things that they really don't deserve credit for. We were very lucky in that we had two leaders, both Senator Thune um, and, um, help me out guys, Senator from Florida, Senator um, Nelson, thanks. Um, that that heard from their local officials and, and said, you know, this would weigh the bill down. And we're just, it's just grateful. It's, it's, it's wonderful when it works. And it really worked here for both Senator Nelson and Senator Thune to step up. Um, and they've, and they've, they've defended the position all along. Now, if there's a rewrite of the act, you know, will we probably look at 332 again? Yeah, the, probably that'll be a request, but um, the, uh, the, the rewrite was a little industry heavy. Um, and so perhaps better to strike it and start over. Um, so that's probably been the highest profile thing that's made progress this year. It's been a big priority for the Senate Commerce Committee and all of the members of the committee seem to feel very good about their ability to agree on it. Um, in the House, there's been a few individual bills that have moved. They haven't been attached to any sort of vehicle that's likely to pass this year. Um, one's anti-spoofing legislation. Another one's the Kelsey Smith Act. Um, what that would do is require providers to give local law enforcement location information for cell phone calls that were either made to 911 or that they have reason to believe were made from somebody who's in danger. Um, it's named after a woman who was murdered and they were unable to find her efficiently because there was a delay in the amount of time that it took for them to get location information from her cell provider. Um, and that's gotten a lot of support. So I think out of anything that might have a chance to move, that's one of the more likely ones. Um, and then the municipal broadband issue. So I think Jerry's gonna talk a little bit more about the court case around that. But we did lose a court case this year. And the court indicated that a solution really was gonna lie with Congress. So um, last year in the Senate, Senator Cory Booker introduced a bill that was intended to stop states from preempting local authority if they wanted to explore municipal broadband. There are some more provisions in there. Um, but recently, uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo from California introduced a similar bill in the House. And I will say neither of these have what I would characterize as bipartisan support or even much support. Um, in the case of Congresswoman Eshoo's bill, it's, she doesn't have any co-sponsors yet, but the idea is to get the conversation started this year 
Um, I don't want to discourage people when I'm saying this thing isn't going to move this year and this thing isn't going to move this year. Um, there's a lot of groundwork being done right now during the last bit of the election season to build coalitions and get conversations started. So I want you all to take a look at those and think about it and have those conversations with your legislators. Um, and just make sure that they're hearing from people on this issue because there is language out there and if we don't discuss it, then it's not going to go anywhere next year when it gets reintroduced. Uh, Angelina has, has it nailed. I, I think sometimes we take things for granted and she and I live this every day, so maybe by the numbers. Um, there are six legislative days left and that's if people work Friday. There are six legislative days left in the fiscal year. So that means by next Saturday, Congress has got to figure out how to keep the government afloat. Um, and for the last seven days, the Senate has been trying to come up with a device called a continuing resolution. A continuing resolution keeps the government funded basically at last year's levels, but they have to make sure that they don't overspend the deficit targets, they, they can do that. But then there are some additional sort of authorizing or policy changes that people want to do, and that's what slows things down. So do we, we provide additional funding for the Zika virus, right? But do we put a prohibition on Planned Parenthood in Puerto Rico being able to be one of the entities that receives it? I mean, that's, that's a real live issue. Or do we use the continuing resolution as a way to send additional funds to Flint, Michigan to address their, their challenges? So, so you've, they've got six days. Now, eh, it's pretty clear that everybody wants to get something done. Uh, yesterday, the House uh, did something called martial law. They passed a resolution to enact martial law, which is the same thing as saying that the speaker can bring a bill to the floor immediately after it comes out of the Rules Committee. Usually there's a couple day lag. And, and, and Angelina is absolutely right. Speaker Ryan, you know, one of his, his mantras is regular order. You know, so this is, I guess you would argue that this is regular order because they're not just doing it, they, they put it up for a vote and everybody got, got the, the, the heads up. So, so you've got eight days, eight, I'm sorry, six legislative days between now and, and, and the end of the fiscal year. As soon as they get that continuing resolution done, I think they're going home. That's what they tell us. I don't know, I think they're going home. And they're not gonna come back until the week after the election, so, and then they'll be in um, to the 16th again. This, that's the target. So there will be 22 planned legislative days after the election, right? Uh, it's November, there's a week in there for, for Thanksgiving, so that's why it's not, so, so 20, and again, this is assuming people work Monday to Friday, right? Which never, ever, ever <laughs> happens. Right? And, and the reason that I use planned is that there's no limitation other than the Constitution that says that Congress has to start one, you know, in this case, it's January the 3rd, I believe. So that means that this Congress, the 107th, can stay until then if they have to, but they'd like to be done, I think. They'll probably take a break for Christmas if they have to, but I believe in their ability to keep people there until Christmas Eve. Right. So, so th there's time, right? But, but now why isn't anything moving in the Senate, right? I mean, we said that the, the Mobile Now Act has got mutual uh, bipartisan support. You know, there's some FCC reauthorization legislation that hasn't been done in years and years. And again, what I'm reporting to you is what has been told to me. Uh, you know, the, we are told that the reason that no telecom legislation is moving is because the minority leader, Senator Reed from Nevada, feels that he was not dealt with fairly with respect to the issue of Commissioner Rosenworcel's nomination or confirmation more specifically. Um, and until that issue is resolved, we don't know how big the hold will be. We, we don't know if it's all telecom legislation. We don't know if it's any legislation coming out of the Commerce Committee, et cetera. So while we're listing all these things, the reason we're saying that probably none of them will get done is not only because of the, the brevity or the limited amount of time between now um, and, and, um, and, and the session ending, uh, but it's also the resolution of Commissioner Rosenworcel's nomination. And there's, I, I think that um, speaks to sort of a lot of larger partisan issues around oversight of the FCC right now. Um, there was a, an oversight hearing last week, um, and 
the issue of the election is really throwing a wrench into the works because we just don't know who is going to be president next year and we don't know what the FCC will necessarily look like. And um, the, the feelings about this, I think, are stopping any substantive work from getting done. Um, so with that, I don't know if you want me to... So the Chairman Wheeler does have a few things that he does want to push through speaking of the FCC, before the end of his term, um, well, before the end of the year. Uh, the big one that we know is coming up this month is the issue of set-top boxes. I know we heard about that yesterday at lunch, um, and it, it's kind of funny to me as the token millennial on the stage that this is such a big issue. Hey. Um, <laughs> hey. is, I don't own a TV. Her, what does she mean? <laughs> proud to use my senior card. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm one of those weirdos who doesn't have a TV or a car, what can I say? So, um, but the big issue for local government in this proceeding was ensuring that PEG content gets protected in whatever solution comes out, whether it's some sort of third party box, whether it's apps, whatever it is, we wanna make sure that local content gets protected and has the same rights that have been painstakingly negotiated over the years. Um, and Chairman Wheeler's put that on the agenda for the FCC's September open meeting, so we expect to see something more substantive about what they've decided to do. That's exactly right, and that's a week from today. I would simply add that the leadership that the Alliance for Community Media and that NATOA have, have, have added to this issue has really been a wonderful, I've been lucky enough to represent the coalition of local governments that have tried to identify the PEG issue as an issue that's important to us, um, and, and NATOA and ACM have been there every step of the way, and so I'd, I'd like to thank them for that leadership. And I think um, in the comments that we all submitted, we definitely took probably one of the more measured approaches to the issue. There's been a lot of um, fire over this from every angle. Um, there's been very strong statements from the FCC. There's been strong statements from Republicans who don't like what the FCC is doing. There have been issues with the cable providers. There have been concerns from content providers, the Copyright Office. And um, I think we have mostly tried to stay outside of what the technical solution needs to look like, just that it needs to have the function of what our content is supposed to do and making it accessible to people. I, I think we we can be a little stronger in, in the fact that it's 20 years ago, the commission was told to come up with, uh, with, with techniques and processes to create a competitive marketplace. I think 20 years is long enough to wait. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's time. And I think the other thing is, is that it is, um, you know, thanks to Mitzi Herrera from Montgomery County, I mean, we were able to document that, that, that a consumer in Montgomery County in the course of a couple of years, we'll have invested, you know, in excess of $300 in a box, and they'll have no more ownership in that box, you know, today than they did at the beginning, and, and, and that's, that's got to change. Um, other issues that are up, and these are definitely not my area of expertise, so I'm going to talk sure. to Derry on sure. this. Sure. So, again, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out not necessarily what we would want, but what we think is the realistic and, and what the chairman has told us are his three priorities. Um, and so the second one is BDS, or uh, Business Data Services. Uh, this is really important to NATOA members. This is hugely important to local governments uh, because every, we, all too often we look at issues in which we are either the landlord, so we're talking about rights of way regulation or compensation, or we look at issues as the regulator or the consumer protector, and we look at it from that standpoint. BDS, we have to look at it from a whole different standpoint, and that is as customers. We are, we are some of the most significant customers that there are in the country. I mean, and, you know, uh, you, you all get that. And so then the question is, how are you purchasing your services today? Are you purchasing them under tariff? And if you're purchasing them under tariff, will that tariff go away if this BDS order comes out? Because again, I'm probably gonna do a disservice by doing this so quickly, but the idea here is that you examine the marketplace and you don't just see if there's a telephone or a traditional telephone company that's providing the service, but is there a cable company or is there a CLEC providing? And if you have multiple folks providing these broadband services to businesses, well then we allow the competitive marketplace to protect the consumer. 
if they're not multiple providers, and again, it's multiple providers providing it at a certain speed, right? So it's not that just that there are three or four people in the marketplace, but there are three or four people in the marketplace that are providing it at a sufficient enough speed that they're, you know, it, it would work on today's applications. And so we've been trying to track it and try to participate. We just haven't been able to, to get a lot of traction with some of the local government folks, but we'll continue to do it. And again, the question is, is today if, I, if, if I'm pr purchasing my services pursuant to a tariff and that tariff goes away, am I guaranteed that my prices are gonna go lower? Um, and I don't know that an awful lot of us have had good experiences with that. So we'll keep you informed uh, as that moves on. And then finally, the third priority that Chairman Wheeler has identified for his end of term uh, is ISP privacy. And again, I think the whole idea of privacy has been important to us in local government. The fact that there's a privacy section in the Cable Act was something that, 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 uh, that local government fought for uh, back in 84 and then repeated it again in 92. Um, you know, so, so that's there, but how all these are all implicated by the open internet order, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we talked about Commissioner, our Chairman Wheeler's end of, uh, end of term agenda. We think that Commissioner Clyburn, because again, we're not forgetting Commissioner Rosen Warsaw, but we don't know, unfortunately, how long she'll be. We hope that she is, is reconfirmed. But Commissioner Clyburn has her agenda, and we only listed the one, I should have listed two. I think if it, her, her two agenda items are, she has, she has made a Herculean effort to try to address what inmates pay for phone calls from, from prisons. And she's worked on this for a number of years and she deserves huge credit. In our world, she has been terrific in trying to identify and protect diverse and independent sources of video programming. And, and to our benefit and her credit, Peg has always been right up front in what she has identified as diverse and independent sources of video programming. I think that the, if there's a surprise here, it's that she, uh, it was first issued as an NOI um, you know, in, in, in late spring, and an awful lot of us were thrilled that it came out as an NOI, notice of inquiry, but we weren't sure that it would move from there, and she has been relentless. Her, her, she has just been tenacious in this, and she's got herself an NPRM that's gonna be rolled out next week. Now, I, I wish I could tell you the details of the NPRM. I, I don't know what they are, but the fact that it's an NPRM and the fact that it's focused on diverse and independent sources of video program is good news for us. It's good news for us. It gives us a terrific platform to continue to push to protect public education and governmental programming, or if I can use one word, community media all at the same time. And just for those of you who don't spend all of your days reading the Federal Register, um, the difference between those two things, a notice of inquiry is more of like, I think this is maybe something we should do. Does anybody have any general feedback? Here are some questions I have. And then the NPRM, the notice of proposed rulemaking is, here's what I think we should do. What do you guys think? Um, so that sort of shows you the progression in the rulemaking process. We better move. Yep. So the real biggie is, is the set top box. Um, and that, oh, I'm sorry, we went the wrong way, okay. We can keep going. Okay, digital inclusion, this is a huge issue for us. Um, NATOA, uh, National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors, NACO, have been really, really aggressive in pushing the idea that, um, that it probably made, it was now time to expand the subsidy that was made available for, for dial tone to expand that subsidy to a broadband service. I mean, if we were trying to going to make a, if we were going to make that lifeline subsidy uh, or that uh, subsidy meaningful in today's economy, it really needed to be available for for broadband service. And so, this is moving forward. The uh, report and order was issued on April the 27th. There are a couple of challenges, but it's still going to go on. Uh, and it'll start uh, at the end of this year, and we'll move forward and, and try to work with it. Um, You've got petitions that are being filed by both the industry and some of the regulators. Everybody's got a bit of an issue with it and, and, and how it works out. Um, I, it, it moves forward, I believe. We also added on here, see also the HUD broadband dockets. Uh, HUD not only is doing the, you know, the, the at-home programs, 
but they've got two proposed rules that they asked comment on, a number of us did comment, that would require that broadband infrastructure be deployed in any HUD-funded housing of four more units, and there's that, and then there's a requirement that uh, today you have to file with HUD sort of your plans for your, how you're gonna spend their money in, in the out years, and there's a new requirement if, if the rule's adopted, there's a new requirement that say you gotta show that as you're making your investments, that they are proximate to broadband providers. Uh, so they don't want you going out to a field that's nowhere near a broadband provider. They want to, to, uh, to, uh, to express uh, how you plan to incorporate uh, that, which is terrific in the sense that the points that we made in the broadband infrastructure requirement was that it doesn't do us any good if we have broadband infrastructure in public housing if there aren't any carriers in the area. Um, and, and we also asked for some additional flexibility that your public housing folks or your community development folks could be viewed as an aggregator of demand where they might be able to make the purchase on behalf of the low income folks in that residence, not unlike what some homeowners associations do today in, in, in their communities and are able to achieve uh, economies of scale and, and better pricing. So we'll keep an eye on that. Closed captioning is, uh, is, is uh, there was a terrific program yesterday. Um, and if you didn't see it, please get the presentation. It, it was very, very good. But from our standpoint, the FCC has always had rules in place that exempt, they don't say they exempt PEG programming, but there are 13 different exemptions and we fit into about three of them at least, right? Those have not changed. Okay, the FCC just issued an order last year. It was published in the Federal Register. There's some confusion about it. What the order does say, though, is that PEG stations and PEG programmers are going to have to register with the FCC. They're going to have to register with the FCC so that there's some place that the complaint can be sent if, you know, if there's a, a closed caption that's wrong or it, it, uh, it uh, isn't being done at all. And, maybe you get the explanation where we're exempt. There's a two-pronged approach to responding to this. Uh, the, the first is the Alliance for Community Media has filed a petition asking the commission to rethink the idea that individual programmers have to be registered. Michael, if I say that incorrectly, please correct me. Uh, there is, the, the, the second effort is the commission itself has got this registration requirement in place, but they don't have a form and they haven't had the form approved by uh, OMB because under the Paperwork Reduction Act, it has to go to OMB. So while today is the effective date for the components of uh, the, the closed captioning order, the comp our registration elements are delayed and our best guess is that nobody will have to register probably until next summer, summer of 2017. There are three opportunities we think for us to be involved to try to make that obligation as streamlined as possible. First, the Bureau has got to create the form and hopefully we'll be able to work with the Bureau to make sure that that works. And then it will go to OMB and we'll be, have the opportunity to participate in the OMB process to maybe streamline it yet again. Uh, and then the, the third uh, sort of stream is, is uh, we'll take our, our leadership from Michael and the Alliance on with respect to the exempting of, of, of programmers and, and hopefully help. Now the courts, and I know that we are painfully behind and I guess we've all learned that I'm better sitting down there than up here. <laughs> and so I apologize to all the speakers that I interrupted all week, I didn't mean to. Uh, so anybody that wants to get even, please feel free. Uh, Beto and Mimi uh, are here, I'm, I'm trying guys, I'll behave out here. So, so a whole bunch, the, the courts, U.S. Telecom Association versus FCC, that's the open internet order. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the FCC's open internet order. Most people want to say it's a two to one vote. I don't think that's true. I think it's a three nothing vote because the dissenting part, uh, judge, when actually his, his, his dissent says that on the issue of whether or not the FCC had the right to go back and recharacterize the service, yeah, I find no limitations on that. So I think that's a three to nothing on, on that point. Now maybe he had some problems on how it was done, but whether or not there was the legal authority. 
there, the, I think the industry, it's, it's safe to say or fair to say, would like to appeal it to the Supreme Court, but as they look right now, there's only eight folks at the Supreme Court. And so they have petitioned for a review en banc uh, at the DC Circuit, and again, I don't think that anybody from the industry believes that that's going to be granted, but what it does is it gives them some time for perhaps there to become a ninth justice. And I think that, you know, again, I, I, I don't mean to belittle the strategy, I think it's brilliant actually, but again, I don't think if you talk to any of them, they believe that the, the, their fellow judges are gonna overturn it or even uh, decide for it to be reheard. Now watch it turn out to be reheard tomorrow and you can all laugh at me and realize that nothing I say is worth listening to. Um, the, there's another order that's ongoing and that's the TOA and the National Association of Broadcasters versus the FCC on the effective competition report and order. Um, and Steve, we got that date right, right? Oral argument is November the 10th. And again, if, if anyone wasn't here the other day, uh, Natoa awarded the National Association of Broadcasters, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's partnership award. I don't have the technical right name, but again, this has been a, a wonderful uh, relationship between the two on this. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting case, FTC versus AT&T Mobility, and an awful lot of us are hearing about this in, in, in Washington. The, this case was brought against AT&T for some of their data throttling practices and it was brought up under, um, uh, the FTC brought it as sort of the prosecutor, as, 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 as the enforcer or the regulator. And what the court said is, no, 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 FTC, there's a, there's a common carrier exemption in your charter. If, if, if the entity's a common carrier, then, then you can't regulate them. Um, and so this is, the, the speculation for a lot of folks in DC is, Ooh, I, you know, I, I wonder, does this mean that a number of large edge providers, and you can fill in your own names for who they may be, uh, edge providers maybe that also own networks or have parts of networks, may go and get themselves certified as a common carrier so that they could, they could be freed of FTC oversight, and so we'll see. But it's also cited as one of the uh, perhaps unintended consequences of the in open internet order because by making the broadband service have a telecommunications component, uh, then do you, do you challenge us? Again, I, I've not been involved in it, I'm simply reporting, but I think it's something we'll see more on as time goes on. Uh, Pam is, is here, again, this is where we're missing Tim Lay. Uh, uh, my colleague, Joe Van Eaton, filed an amici in this, uh, uh, City of Eugene, Oregon versus Comcast. That court upheld, and this is the Oregon Supreme Court, upheld the imposition of Eugene's 7% right-of-way fee on Comcast broadband service. And it upheld it despite the claims by Comcast that the Internet Tax Freedom Act or the Cable Act uh, limited. So the lesson for all of us here, and I know that you know it, but it's worth repeating, this is why it's so vitally important when you do your cable franchise that you limit the grant of authority for the provision of cable services over a cable network. Right, people, the, the industry will come back to you with, with, with broader language and again, I think that the lesson for us here is do not, do not, do not give away authority that you don't have to in a cable act. All you have to provide in a cable franchise is the authority to provide cable services over a cable network and that's it. And then unfortunately, uh, the, the bad news is that the FCC's efforts to promote uh, municipal provisioning by preempting state laws under Section 253A um, that, uh, that uh, either uh, bar or have the effect of prohibiting communication services. Uh, the, the court said no, they, they can't do that. Um, and, and the reason that they can't do that was very much similar to the rationale that was given in a case a number of years ago, uh, Missouri, uh, Missouri League of Cities uh, versus um, uh, Gore, D different, Nixon, Nixon, thank you. There's the pro in the room. Um, and, and, and that's the idea that the relationship between local governments and state governments is a creature creator. Um, and, and while Congress can, can sort of force its way into that relationship, it has to do it 
uh, definitively, clearly. It, it can't be nuanced, right? Um, now, I think an awful lot of us read Section 253A to be pretty definitive, that no entity can, can, can prevent it, uh, but that's not how the courts have read it. And so um, uh, that, that's where we are. Uh, one of the questions the other day, um, Sean, uh, for the 75 questions in 75 minutes, one of the questions was, do we see the, the Tennessee, North Carolina case as uh, generating additional anti-muni provisioning uh, legislation around the country. I mean, uh, uh, Sean uh, and, and, and Jim Baller have got the definitive uh, library on the 19 states that, that have limitations. Sean, do you see it as spurring additional ones? I don't know. It's hard to pick the ball up because, you know, uh, after the Nixon decision, there ended up being a number of Right, and, and if I could ape uh, um, Ken Feldman, what Ken said was, but this also shows us that there are some affirmative things that we want to work for in a rewrite and, and clarifications. It, we, we should not just be on defense if there's a rewrite of the act. Uh, and, and, and this is clearly one of the areas where we could get clarification or, or should at least seek clarification. Are you Jerry Letterer interrupting from the field? <laughs> Please. I, absolutely correct. I mean, and under the, the whole idea of Chevron deference to the expert agency, I think you're right. If, if you're not citing to that in future litigation, then you're missing an opportunity. Um, the, the 6409 uh, uh, appeal uh, unfortunately did not go our way. Uh, the Fourth Circuit uh, upheld the FCC's wireless citing order. Uh, I wanted to add real quick on this. Uh, there was a case just to hand it down, T-Mobile versus the city of San Francisco where the city of San Francisco was successful in challenging some of T-Mobile's deployments under aesthetic uh, 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 reasons. Um, it's, it's incredibly important in, in that uh, Section 7901, which is the California law, is probably one of, if not the most restrictive state laws on what a local government can do with respect to access to the rights of way. It, it really is very aggressive. And so the fact that a California court uh, despite the fact that there was a utility franchise in place and there's CPUC regulation uh, did not sort of limit the city's ability to address aesthetics, I think it's good news for all of us and it's something that, that we ought to think about. And then, uh, and then finally, we still have the 621 uh, video franchising uh, appeal pending and we talked about that the other day and, and its importance. You know, this is a good time to congratulate Steve and the rest of the Natoa staff and Jody and Mike Lynch and the officers. Um, everything that we've talked about here, there's already been a full-fledged panel on and, and the programming committee did a great job. I'm just gonna leave it at that so we can get to, 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 to FirstNet. Um, we had a terrific panel on FirstNet yesterday. Um, it was, I mean, we're, we're, we're lucky that, uh, that Barry Frazier has been our point for local government on that from day one. Still, there are things that each one of you ought to be involved in with respect to FirstNet, and you ought to be thinking about it in your hometown today. 
or your home county or whatever the case may be. Um, and again, there's nothing here that is really overly insightful. It's just we think that the value is that it's captured on, on one page. And we have uh, Barry and, and <clears throat> Mike Watson in the back of the room and I crafted this for a program that we did for the municipal lawyers. We have since put this up on the uh, IMLA listserv and we put it up on the Natoa policy listserv if folks want to offer uh, insights. But just something as simple as if your police department and if you happen to be doing their procurement and, and they have a phone contract that's coming due and somebody's telling them that they want to offer them a deal for five years, you know, maybe that's too long. Maybe that's too long. Maybe you, you want to start thinking about what you're spending on now and how it gets replaced by FirstNet. Uh, otherwise, you're duplicating that spending in the out years. So uh, one of the difficulties is, is that we won't have a clearer understanding of what FirstNet is offering uh, until uh, the fall, <coughs> uh, 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 later this fall. Um, and, and then when it's presented, governors are gonna be given 90 days to either opt in or opt out. But if you opt out, you have to come up with your own state plan. Today, as the federal law is written, Local governments have no obligation to participate in FirstNet. I think that's gonna disappear the way Kurt explained to us how you can be saved by the legislature. I think if the state is on the hook for a bill <laughs> from FirstNet, I think they're gonna make sure that all the localities chip in. So I think that's coming. So the, I, the fact that we don't have an obligation to participate doesn't mean uh, today doesn't mean we won't tomorrow. So you, you should be thinking about, it. I mean, it's also probably, you know, I, I don't think anyone wants to be the mayor. I don't, he or she want to be the mayor if an officer or a fireman or a public works guy responding to an emergency uh, are hurt because they, they don't have the latest in communications. So I think it's coming. Uh, I know it's coming. Uh, the question is, how do you make sure that you can, how, how can you participate without breaking the, the, the bank um, and, and I think that's a real threat because FirstNet still can't give us an idea on pricing despite our asking. So that's it for us. Questions? Yeah, because the election outlook, you can, you can see. The second you showed up, Adam, that went blank. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to clarify one thing that you said, Jerry, because we do have press. So as far as the Internet Tax Freedom Act is concerned, right. at least as far as Natoa is concerned, uh, we never wanted it made permanent, and we were right. never in alignment with some other associations' strategy to tie that with okay. the Marketplace Fairness Act. So My apologies. Just want to make no, 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 no problem with yeah. it. Was a, an, a, it was a very strange situation in Washington that when that happened, uh, but again, it, it was a a move that folks kind of tied the two together, right. but we didn't like it because we always thought that internet, uh, the ability to tax it, uh, internet would still always be on the table for local governments to look at, so. Thanks, Steve. Any questions? Oh, come on, who wants to be Jerry Letter and yell something? The <laughs> this is your chance for revenge. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Mike Wassener from ACM. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the panel today. Since we're just a, a couple of short, sweaty steps from the state capitol, I have to ask uh, about the legacy of SB5, uh, which I, I, I think, you know, is the, the first of the state bills that we saw in the course of the, the late aughts um, that had a pretty harsh effect on local governments, certainly. Um, and I, I think anecdotally, we can say, um, devastated uh, local peg programming and local media diversity in many parts of the country. Um, and I know it's had effect here in Texas, um, where we see um, a city like Dallas has closed its uh, media facility, and now it's just a, their G and E channel operations going on there because just the budgetary strain that's been put on the, the local municipality. So I'm just kind of curious, in just some perspective, is about whether or not Texas communities care enough to talk to the federal government about the impact of this and whether or not there's any way that there could be simple steps to help alleviate the, 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 the strain that's been put on Texas communities uh, with this sort of precursor of bad things that happen in many other communities around the state. Uh, so it's sort of like a 
10, 11 years after of SB5 questions, so. I, I would think it's going to be an uphill battle to make any changes to it. I think if I'm on the other side right now and I'm a provider uh, and the people that were on the other side in 2005, I'm going to look at this legislative session to advance my program that I think the perception is that cities and communities are weak in Texas this session. I mean, you just look at how the lieutenant governor feels about Texas cities and their rights to govern themselves. It's not favorable. So if I'm the other side and I, I think they are good, I think I pick on trying to make it worse going forward. So I don't know if those are good words, but they're, they're, uh, they're honest. Cor correct uh, yeah. observation. I, I would I would just suggest though that there are a couple of companies out there today that are making the exact same arguments about if we could just move local government out of the way or if we could just reduce the rights of way management obligations we would come in and we would provide all those services well I'm sorry we heard that in you know I, I have a presentation called promises made promises broken Right, and we were told that if you did away with local franchising, there would be more choice, there would be lower prices, and we would create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Right. I have another, this is Gabriel Garcia from San Antonio. I have another follow-up question for Mr. Seidlitz. Uh, what do you think we're gonna see in terms of uh, a bill uh, as a result of the Crown Castle uh, and extant proceedings before the Public Utility Commission? Uh, that proceeding, I checked today the status of the, the PUCT action, and interestingly enough, I don't think staff was filing comments, but they were going to file a statement of position. So I think that's in October. So if you get some kind of ruling adverse to uh, Crown Castle, I think a bill will follow the lines of their defeat, and they'll try to turn legislation that says they really do have those rights that they've alleged in the complaint filed with PUC pursuant to the Dallas imposition of fees. So. I have a follow up. What, uh, wireless carriers are in a position where they don't have certificates of authority. Uh, are they likely to piggyback on, on such a bill? I'm sorry, what was the last? Are they likely to try to piggyback on such a bill? Uh, I would think so. I think I'd be ready for all angles. Any other questions? Well, we're a minute over, which I feel is actually pretty good considering how much ground we covered. So um, before, oh. Just, just really quick, and, and I just wanted to check on, online before I said this. Uh, as far as the community broadband uh, bill that SU has, mm -hmm. we should not, forget that McCain had a very similar bill, and this was back in 2005. So there's definitely support on the R side if we can get back to him and say, now's the time to, to renew those efforts. There is, and he's in a very complicated election, so hopefully we'll be able to have that conversation in November. Um, so with that, thank you all, and I guess it's time for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was okay. Yeah.